Oh, wow. How's everybody doing? How many people were here last night? Were you here last night? That's good. That's good. Uh, if you weren't here last night, my name is Andrew. I am originally from Ireland, as you've just seen, uh, but now living in Sacramento, California. A little bit warmer than here, but this is like Ireland, everyone. I love this weather. Yes, a little bit more like Ireland. And what a beautiful, beautiful part of the world that you live in. What wonderful people you are. And uh, people talk about Minnesota nights. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. Well, you guys are nice. Every single person I meet, they're just so pleasant, so warm, so hospitable. And we want to thank you uh, for having us here. This my wife, Isabel, is over here. And, uh, and we've just had a ball being here the last couple of days. We're getting to spend the whole weekend in the city. And we're just having fun. So from my heart to your heart, thank you. And also bringing you love from Bayside Church. Uh, some of you maybe have heard of that before. If you haven't, don't worry. Uh, but our founding pastor, uh, Ray Johnson sends his love and all of the team, Lincoln and all the guys. And thank you to your staff as well for coming to our conference a few times. We really, really appreciate, appreciate that. And anything that we can do for you, please let us know. But I'm, I'm encouraged. I'll be bringing stuff back from here to Bayside because you guys are knocking it out of the park. Did you see that illustration there, that metaphor from America? I'm doing my best there, everyone, knocking it out of the park. <laughs> I've never done that in my life, but I, I'm trying to do my best. But uh, I have to say, you're building your uh, facilities, but the sense of community that you have as a church is fantastic. And I know this, that genuinely, if I was living in this area, I'd want to bring my family to this church. You guys are special. God is doing something here. And can you hear me for one second? I've been to enough lame churches in the world <laughs> to know a good church when I see one. And can I ask you to do this? Can I ask you just as a church, one, to appreciate what God is doing here? Because I heard the history of your church, and this just could have been a field, or this could have been like some pretty home sitting here, or a few liquor stores, I don't know, or a Kmart. But listen, the church of Jesus Christ is on this plot because people had faith. People held on. People kept turning up. People sacrificed. And you guys came along. And you know what? I believe it's only the beginning of what God wants to do in and through this church. I got to meet Pastor Dan last night. What a cool guy he is, yes? I mean, if you could clone pastors, you, you would take a sample of his DNA, wouldn't you? You know, he's just a... He's a really good guy, and Randy and all the staff and just the fun around here. Uh, this is one thing that we try to focus on at Bayside is health before growth. And this is what we realize, that healthy things grow. And all I can say to you is you've got a good church, love on your church, protect your church. Uh, and you know what? I give your church a break sometimes because all I'm going to say is, you know, some people, they get so harsh towards the church. They're Christians. They get harsh towards the church. And I go, well, you know what? Is your family perfect? Are the Waltons here this morning? The Waltons? <laughs> Swiss Family Robinson, anyone around, you know, there's no perfect families in, in, in this world, and neither is the church a perfect family, but when you get a good family, love on it and appreciate it. Is that okay, everyone, to say that? Because this is a good church. This is a really good church. Okay, uh, so we're going to talk about this. Our whole conference is called Thrive, and I want to talk this morning, and just, uh, there's no wrong answer here. I'm looking out at, uh, for Dan or anyone. What time should I finish at? 12, 15 or 15, because there's quite a difference. <laughs> 15, one five. Okay, that 12, 15. And where is the clock? Oh, I've got 30 minutes. Let's do this, baby. Okay, everyone ready? Okay. All right, you know, because you're all legalists right now. He said 12, 15. He better finish 12, 15. <laughs> so here we go. Let's pray, and we'll ju just jump right into it. Father, I want to thank you that you're here. You're not far from us. We're not hoping you're going to turn up. But God, we brought you here in us this morning, God. When we left last night, you went home with us. You were there all night in our rooms, Lord. You're in our lives, and we want to thank you for that. And I just pray that we would know really know that you are here, sense your presence mightily, and you would send us from this place with further revelation of your will for our lives in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thriving life, what's it all about? A really smart man, William Barclay, a Scotsman who did wear a kilt, he said this, there are two great days in a person's life, the day they are born and the day they find out why. Yes, for most of us, 
we still celebrate our birthday, okay? We know when we were born. We've marked that day. We know our birthday, but not many of us know our why day, why we were born. And I want you to try and really try and grasp just how significant it is that you were born, that God brought you into this world, that you really do have potential in your life. If I were to go and bring all the three and four-year-olds in now and line them up across the front of the stage and say, how many people believe that they've got great potential? What would you say? Oh, come on, everyone. How many people would say, three and four-year-olds have got great potential? Yay, yay, come on, we would do that. But you know, if we lined up some 45-year-olds and said, how many people believe they've got great potential? We'd be like, oh, not so sure, a bit old now. I know him now. <laughs> We get a little bit older and a little bit jaded and we're not convinced. But I still believe that God sees the child in us and I still believe that God sees the original plan he had for our lives inside of us. So I need you to work with me here for a moment. This is going to be an awful lot for 11.46 in the morning, okay? But I need you to work with me. I want you to look at me. I am an Irishman and uh, I am not Michael Phelps. How many people have ever heard of Michael Phelps? Okay, the greatest Olympic of all time from America. You guys, you can produce athletes. You're amazing. And Michael Phelps, incredible swimmer. But look at this guy here. I have never been put on the Irish Olympic swimming team. I don't, I don't even know if we have one, okay? And uh, we're so wet over there, we just try to avoid the pool. Um, but uh, but I, I've, I've never been on the Irish Olympic swimming team. But I want you to try and work with me here for a, a second. So I'm 47 years old, okay, and about 48 years ago, there was a moment of passion <laughs> in the McCourt household. Is everyone still with me? Are you still with me? Okay. There was a moment of passion in the McCourt household, and I started a swimming race, everyone. <laughs> Are you with me? Now, husbands, if you don't know what I'm talking about, ask your wife later, okay? She will explain it to you, all right? I, I started a swimming race, and it wasn't like this. It wasn't eight lanes wide. There was 300 million of us in the beginning of the swimming race. Do you know what I'm talking about? 300 million of us, boom, we went off, flying, just flying along, flying along, and just doing the various maneuvers. It was an epic, epic swimming race. And you know, right from the beginning, okay, I kept going, but a few of my potential siblings, they went, they, did, they just absolutely faded out like some of you are right now. And they just like, they just faded out. But we kept going. We kept swimming, kept swimming, kept swimming. And then at one point we sort of like hid on the side, took a little bit of a break, and then kept going again. And then everyone, I had to, and you had to, we had to make our very first decision ever, okay? Now you've never said this in a church before. You probably never will, but you're going to say it now. Everyone say, fallopian tube. I don't get nervous. God made them, all right? And you've been up one. All right, so everyone, relax and work with me, okay? Don't get religious. This is good biology. This is just good biology. And I had to go right, left, right, left. What one am I going to go? I don't know if it was left or right, but I chose the right one, everyone. I chose the right one. I got through. You've never been so excited about a fallopian tube in your life. And, and I went through. And do you know what, everyone? I got to the egg First, the egg was so tall, it was like the size of Nelson's column in London compared to me. That's how big an egg is compared to a little, not even say the word in church. Okay, <laughs> I got into the egg. Look at me, everyone. I won a swimming race. <laughs> so did you. I won a swimming race. We won, everybody. We won. You beat 300 million to get into this world that means you've nothing to prove. See, peer pressure is not just a thing for teenagers. It's for adults as well. Because as men, we get nervous about the type of car that we drive. Or the size of our house. The size of our salary. How our kids are performing. Moms get really nervous about that. Oh, we just want them to do well. But sometimes, we just don't want to look bad compared to the neighbors. Yes, 
where we go on vacation, how much we spend on this, the size of Christmas presents. There is so much peer pressure today. I live in California, everybody. We have so many plastic surgeons. It's beyond belief. Everyone's trying to fight gravity. It's not working. We're falling, everybody. <laughs> It's not working. There is so much peer pressure today. And God says, you were brought into this world with a plan and a purpose. This is what David says. In my mother's womb, you knew me. You put me together. You formed me. You shaped me. In my mother's womb, you were formed by God himself. And I think this is amazing that God put me together. David says in one translation that he knitted me together in my mother's womb. That's, you know, how many grandmothers used to knit? How many of your grandmother used to knit? I remember my grandmother knitting there with the needles. With her. God sitting, kneading, you know, knitting, knitting. Gabriel, bring me a leg. God's going to put it in there. Go <laughs> put it in there. And God says, you know, give me a personality. Need. Give me an extrovert. Yes, give me a big mouth. In Ireland, they don't say, I kissed the Blarney Stone. They say, I swallowed it. <laughs> I talk so much. So did Molly. And uh, <laughs> God put me together. God said, let's really bless him. Let's make him very favored. Make him Irish. <laughs> what did God do for you? God brought you into this world. He put you together. Why did he put you in this world? Well, this is the very first thing, the whole thing about destiny in our lives, is finding out that we were born for someone. You were born for someone, and it's finding your creator, everyone. The whole journey from birth after the tubes and getting out <laughs> is a journey towards our creator. God wants you to know him. I'm going to presume in a morning like this that majority of people here are Christians. And finding our creator or having found him is all about passion, everybody. I'm married 25 years in August. 25 years in August. Thank God that woman is full of grace and mercy and has kept me. But there's still passion in our marriage. There's passion in our lives. And knowing your creator is all about passion. I don't know if you ever heard the story of the couple. And they, they were together. But they argued from the day that they got married. I mean, they argued and argued and argued and argued and argued. And the same anniversary that we're about to experience, they finally agreed on one thing after 25 years that they needed counseling. And then they argued about what counselor they should use. And then when they agreed on that, they argued about what day of the week they should go on. Then they argued, should they take the car or should they travel on the train to the appointment? They argued about everything. Should we take the elevator or take the stairs up to his office? I mean, it was a disaster. Finally, they sat in front of the counselor. He was at his desk, and they were in two chairs, and he said, start. Well, they just argued. They just spewed it out. And this counselor, do you know what? Professional guy, experienced guy, he was overwhelmed. He thought, in all my years of counseling, I have never heard anything like this in my life. Exasperated, after listening to them for two hours, he got up from behind his desk. He walked around. He grabbed the wife, he put her over his knee, laid his lips on her, and gave her the biggest kiss of her life. He didn't come up for a breath for about a minute. He calm, finally breaks off the kiss, looks at the husband. You know what she needs? She needs that at least twice a week. And the husband says, I'll bring her every Tuesday and Thursday. <laughs> bring her every Tuesday and Thursday. You see, the mistake was that he was thinking someone could put passion into his relationship. And we make the mistake sometimes of just thinking, if I turn up to church, if I go to a small group twice a week, my pastor, my worship leader, the church staff, they, excuse it, can put the lips on my relationship with God. They can put the, put the passion in. And listen to me, everyone. You cannot have a spiritual relationship vicariously through your pastor. You can't do it. This, when we come together as a church, is the expression of what we've been doing all week long. I prayed it in my prayer. We don't come to church to find God. We come to church to bring God. 
We are personal carriers of God himself in the world. And what God wants us to know is the passion. Paul writes this from a prison cell. He said, I want to know Christ. I've served him for years. I've suffered for years. I've had highs. I've had lows. I've seen people come to Christ. I've seen great people walk away from me. But after it's all said and done, there's only one thing that I want to know, and that is Christ. And even the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to know him personally. Listen to me. You will never find anyone better than God. No one ever better than God. Nothing will ever satisfy your soul and your reason for being and for being created than God himself. I remember, I was about 33, 34, I was just having a, a, my devotional times. And this is what I found as a pastor, I'm only as deep as my devotions. The time that I get with God, the time that I spend with God... And what is devotions about? It's about getting a Bible. You can have a worship CD on or whatever you want, whatever your, your choice is of that. Getting a coffee and just getting time with God. And I remember that day just with the coffee in my hand, with the Bible in my hand, and worship music playing. And I'm not a singer, but when I'm by myself, I can sing. I can really sing. And Jesus loves it. He really loves it. And I remember that day just worshiping God. And I remember thinking to myself, I was 30, say it's 33, 34. I remember thinking to myself, I could actually, this is as a happily married man, a father of four kids, just life is good. I could go home now and be with the Lord. I could go home now and be with the Lord. Because his presence is so real. And so fulfilling that it's actually from leaving the spot where I was sitting, everything else is downhill. I don't care where I could go on vacation, what car I could get into, a Ferrari, a Lamborghini, I don't care. But from that moment, I just knew the only thing that truly satisfies my soul is God himself. That's it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German pastor, theologian, ultimately martyr, he said this. It's divine homesickness. When you experience God, your soul yearns for eternity. We used to sing it years ago as kids. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. All my treasures, what? They're laid up way beyond the sky blue. I mean, this is not it, everyone. And Jesus said, don't live for this and don't live for stuff where thieves and rust and moth and everything that can come in and steal it. Don't live for this. Do not be fooled. Don't buy into the lie, everybody. You were born for God. It's about passion. It's also about presence. Knowing that your creator is actually understanding that you have the presence of God in your life. Look at what Jesus says here in the Gospel of John, this verse. It says, the sheep listen to his voice. Are you one of his sheep? Yes, you are. The sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them Uh, He calls them by name. He calls you by name. He calls me by name. Isn't that so cool, everyone? He knows us from the moment we were conceived and he knitted us together in our mother's womb. He knows your name. He knows Andrew Manley. He knows all of your names and he calls you by name. He calls you out. And what does it say here? And he leads them out. I am the greatest believer that as soon as I became a Christian, listen to me, as soon as I became a Christian, I am entered into the most incredible relationship with God, the third person, the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. The Holy Spirit, for an awful lot of Christians, is just the one that makes you feel bad. He's the convictor of sin. No, he's not. He's way more than that. The Holy Spirit is the one who leads us to Christ. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. Then we are reborn of the Holy Spirit. And then Roman tells us then we live in the Holy Spirit. We walk in the Holy Spirit. We are led by the Holy Spirit. Galatians tells us that we cannot bear fruit outside of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians says that we should be filled with the Holy Spirit continually in our lives. Not a one-off experience. Continually. Continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. We should pray in the Spirit. We should use the sword of the Spirit. Listen to me. When you read the New Testament, it's all Holy Spirit. And how do we think that we can live a victorious Christian life 
with just discipline. That's just your old Scandinavian roots. And you need to rebuke that, okay? Some cool things in the Reformation, some fancy things about being a Protestant, but I'm going to say this here. Yes, we need the Word, but the Word is full of the Spirit, and the Spirit is the author of the Word of God. You can't like pick and choose. It's not a buffet, everyone. It's Word and Spirit. It's the Spirit that makes the Word come alive in our lives. And as soon as I became a Christian, when I was eight years old, I was filled with the Spirit of God. The presence of God came into my life, and I was God. From that moment, God zip code on earth. And so are you. Yes? We carry personally the presence of of God in our lives, everybody. And when we come to church, it's an expression, corporate expression, of all being these personal carriers of the Holy Spirit, the living Holy Spirit. He's not just a power, he's a person, everyone, that we can talk to. Look what Tozer says here. I think this is just amazing. How many people know Tozer? A.W. Tozer? You like Tozer? I mean, if, God, if it's like if there's God, then there's Tozer and Spurgeon. You know, we were talking like that, okay? It says, oh God, come feelingly near. God drew feelingly near to Moses in the bush and on the mount. He came feelingly near to the church at Pentecost, and he came feelingly near to the Corinthian church when the unbelievers went away awestruck to report that God is really in their midst. I am willing to confess in humility that we need this in our day. How many people agree with that? How many people agree that when people come in here on a Sunday or a Saturday night tonight, that they should feel that God is in this place? Even the most hardened atheist in the world, we we won't win over with an argument, and thank God for great apologies, apologists, and, and for all the arguments that we have, but when they come into the corporate expression, the family of God, the house of God, they should feel the presence of God. We're not the Rotary Club, everybody. We're not a community club. We are the church of Jesus Christ, filled with the Spirit of God. He is alive, everyone. He is a seal guaranteeing us of what is to come, Ephesians tells us. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. He's inside of our lives. You have the person of God living inside of you. I think it's the best news in the world. What about you? You're like, no, well, whatever, whatever. You know, I'm waiting for a new Toyota. Who cares? You carry God. Speak to him. Guess what? He'll speak to you. Stop. Sit. Slow. Turn the volume down. Get rid of people. Eject them from your house. (laughs) Go find a space. Brother Lawrence, have you ever heard of it? Practicing the presence of God. There's practice to the presence. It's a practice, everyone. It's a discipline in my life. This is one thing I find is I leak. I leak. I wish I was just filled all the time, all the time. Does the Holy Spirit change? No, He doesn't. I do. I leak. Lose focus. I need fresh energy, fresh manna for every single day of my life. I had the privilege. I hadn't planned to say all of this, but Isabella and I were at a conference in December at Windsor Castle. Oh, brother. You know? Oh, yes. And, and, and two things. We turn up at Windsor Castle. It was really special. Because the flag is at full mast. Does anyone know what that means? The Queen's there. See, normally she's there from Thursday night to Sunday night. She goes back to her other little house, Buckingham Palace. But we turned up on a Monday and the flag was still there. And listen to me, over your life and over my life, the flag's up. The king is at home. He's at home. One of these previous conferences, I got to in a room of just 40 people. This is the coolest thing. Like we're staying in Windsor Castle, everyone. The room that we meet in, 40 of us there, is where William Shakespeare first played to Elizabeth I, his play, The Wives of Windsor. It's the room that we're meeting in. 
And the Archbishop of Canterbury came to speak here, Justin Welby. And, and the Church of England, Anglican Church, has some challenges right now, but he's a godly man. Pray for him. He's a godly man. Spirit filled, just a good man. Godly, godly man. And he spoke to us. He just said, no tweeting. Because I don't want to be headline papers tomorrow. He's got 77 million people in his congregation. Globally. A lot of responsibility. But he just talked about this. He just talked about in life how he has built his life around um, a certain code and structure of five times daily prayer. So his secretary, his admin, looks after his calendar. And the first thing that goes in every day is the five times prayer. I thought to myself, I think Bayside's big, but he's got 77 million in his church and stops to pray five times a day. Practicing the presence of God. Let me put it this way to you. When I first came here to the United States, uh, we had made the decision to um, come to Bayside, but we hadn't moved yet. And we needed to come out in Easter to check out school. So we brought all the children with us. Had to fly from Ireland to San Francisco. Long way, everyone. Long, long way. It's an 11-hour flight. And I arrived in San Francisco, which is crazy. That's what it means. It's just a crazy, wonderful place. I love San Francisco. And, uh, and I went then. I had to get all my baggage, get through American Customs, and then get uh, over to the car rental place. So by this time, I'm like, I mean, it's way late in the middle of the Irish night, okay? You know what I'm talking about? I am like so jet lagged beyond belief. And, and I go, and there's this line there, okay? It's like Costco again. It's just like a Costco line. It's just to get a car. Eventually, I get my car. And this here is the car that they give to me, okay? Does anyone drive one of these? Why? I mean, that is not a car. That's an aircraft carrier. I mean, small planes were landing on the roof when we got out. And I'm looking at this. I mean, back in Ireland, we got roads this wide. We all drive these small cars. I mean, this thing is enormous. The kids get in way at the back. They can't even hear me. They're in a different time zone back there. I have to text them, okay, just to get them. To it's just absolutely crazy. I got to take that like whole like, pile of metal. Look at it. You know, it's like a refinery. I got to take that out on the skinny roads of San Francisco into rush hour traffic and get it over Bay Bridge. Oh, people. Oh, people. This is like witchcraft. I mean, this is just crazy. So I get in the car. I am nervous. Everyone pray for dad. And you're just getting in the car. This is a huge beast. And so we're driving then on the Bay Bridge. I'll never forget this. I am shaking. I am terrified. I got my teenage boy behind me. Teenage boy. And he's got his headphones in. You know those teenagers, you know, they never talk. They're just like oh, all the time, you know, whatever. And, and so he's got his music on. And he's sitting right behind me. And he starts tapping. He starts tapping his foot with the music. He starts tapping his foot. And it's against my seat. And I can feel it. And I'm like, son, stop it. Stop it. You're distracting me. How many people know what I'm talking about, okay? You're, you're distracting me. I'm trying to focus here. I'm trying to focus. And he's tapping, he's tapping, and, and he bends, he gets the earplugs. It's not me. It's not me. Yes, it is you. Well, anyway, he stops. But he moves to the left foot then. And he starts tapping with the left foot. Stop tapping your foot. Leave, please. Your dad's trying to drive. We could all die. I'm perfectly calm at this moment in time, okay? Okay, and, and then, so I'm going, and he goes, no, it's not me. I say, you're a liar, teenage liar. I mean, leave me alone. And, and so, so, so then this is what I realized. It's not him tapping. It's not him tapping. It's this special lane drift activation system that's built into the seat of the car because there's cameras underneath the car. And when you start going over the white line, it shakes you here on this side. It does. It shakes you here. And when you go over to this side, it shakes you over here. And I was loving it. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was doing circles before you knew it. I was just. Uh, why did I tell you that today? Why, why did I tell you? <laughs> You're going, I don't care. It's funny. <laughs> why did I tell you that today? This is why I tell you that. Because, listen. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. Some of you are going, ah, I know what you're going to do right now. 
Yeah, yeah, when we start going off track. When we start going off track, the Holy Spirit, <laughs> the convictor, he starts going, no, 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 don't do that. It's like God's emergency system. And yes, he does do that. Because we're warned as well in Scripture, do not grieve the Spirit of God. You can't grieve a power. You can only grieve a person who we're in relationship with. Yes? I've never grieved my cooker. I've never grieved my fridge. I've grieved my wife, <laughs> whom I'm in relationship with. Yes? So we're thinking to ourselves, yeah, I know that. So if I drift there, if I drift there, if I go too far in the computer, if I watch that, ooh, the Holy Spirit will go, ooh, and I shouldn't do that and come back. Come on, the Holy Spirit is not a police officer. Yes, he is a protector. But the Holy Spirit, my friends, knowing that you are born for someone, finding your creator in your life, he's the person who takes us off road. He's the person that says you've stuck between the lanes too long. You're on the wrong road. You're going too slow. Speed up. Go right. Go over there. Your neighbor needs you. Go over to the left. But God, I had plans today. And you will suddenly hear the still, small voice of God. And listen to me, everyone. If he's not alive, and if he's not inside of me, why did Jesus die? Why was he raised from the dead? What hope is there for me today? If God said, you're forgiven for your past, you know what? Oh, I hope you do rest. I hope you do well for the rest of your days. You sucked at it before. relationship comes inside of us. Read the book of Acts, everyone. The Acts of the Holy Spirit, of how God birthed the, the church through His Spirit, how Peter went from this timid, timid runaway to suddenly in his first sermon, 3,000 people. He thought his first sermon would be his last sermon. He thought he'd probably be crucified by his, uh, like his Lord just straight after. And God birthed the church. They were led by the Spirit, prevented and stopped by the Spirit in the area of Macedonia. It's incredible, everyone. Just read it. I think today the church is so can be so lame sometimes and tepid. It's, and it's not like, oh, blame the leaders, blame the pastors. I'm talking we're all priests. We're all priests. God wants to, I'm going to say this, jazz up your day and jazz up your life and mess up your plans and mess up my plans. He is real. You go, he never talks to me. Well, do you ever talk to him? Start a conversation today with the Holy Spirit. Start a conversation with God and say, God, take me. If it's to do with sin, keep me within the lines. If it's to do with your will, take me out of the lines. I'm tired of sticking to the script of society. I'm tired of doing that, Lord. I don't want to do it anymore. I've got my 15-year-old daughter. Is she perfect? Almost. <laughs> and I look at her now, and she's just got something, and her mom will tell you this, she's just got something of the Holy Spirit in her life. She's just got something of the Spirit She's beginning to share like some scripture strategically with some friends in school. And friends are starting to cry and they're starting to say, I can't believe that you told me that, Abigail. And she's starting to ask God for these scriptures. She doesn't know where they all are. She feels the Lord is leading her to certain scriptures. The Holy Spirit always leads you to the word of God. Never leads you outside of the word of God. That's flaky cuckoo stuff. The Holy Spirit will always lead you to the spirit of God. Or sorry, into the word of God. Listen to this Holy Spirit, so gentle, so beautiful. He comes alongside. See, the Holy Spirit is not the parakeet. He's the paraclete. He's not the one on your ear going, you're awful, you're messing up, there you go again. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. He's the one who draws alongside to lead us in our lives. I'll finish with this. My mom hasn't been too well recently. She was at the, another consultant appointment. 
uh, you know, you missed them. A long, you know, it's a long way from home and you're getting all this information via the phone. But my dad told me this. My dad's just great. He's just a talker. Again, Blarney Stone guy. And um, loves chatting. He'd chat to anyone. Great evangelist. Started speaking to the consultant. And he was talking to the consultant about longevity. This is what the consultant said. Oh, Mr. McCord, it's not that we're living longer. It's just that we're taking longer to die. <laughs> cheery chap, you know, really cheery chap. <laughs> it's not that we're living longer. It's just that we're taking longer to die. See, that's called surviving. That's not called thriving. I don't want to take longer to die. I want to live. Are you with me? I want to live. Today could be my last day. Today could be your last day. The next breath could be your last breath. Don't presume, people. If you want to live a thriving life, how do you live a thriving life? Realize that supernaturally you were born into this world. And I don't know the circumstances of your birth. And maybe even that opening illustration was tinged with a touch of sadness for you. Because you think that, well, listen to me, you got into this world. You still got into this world. And why were you brought into this world? Different faces, different places, different passports, different backgrounds, all of that. Okay, some of us can wear kilts, others can't. But listen. We were all brought into this world so that we would be reunited with our creator, God himself. And when we are reunited with him, heaven comes. Listen to me. Yes, I will go to a place one day called heaven, but heaven has already come to me. In the form of Jesus Christ, in the presence of the Holy Spirit inside of my life, everyone. I am living on earth with the person of the Holy Spirit inside of me. With the energy and the truth of God's word that he takes and it just applies to my life. Listen to me, everyone. With that, I can live a thriving life. I want you to close your eyes. But don't get religious. Don't get religious on me. I want you to close your eyes. You bow your head. And we're going to take a moment. I had to stop preaching, but didn't say I couldn't pray. You close your eyes. I want you to put your hands out in front of you like you're going to receive a gift. Just put, it, put out your hands in front of you. Don't, don't feel frightened now. Nothing spooky is going to happen, please. You go crazy at a hockey game. Come on hands out like you're going to receive a gift because that's what the Holy Spirit is that's who he is he's a gift of God to our lives put your hands out in front of you Father I pray today for these very precious people they came here on a Saturday morning they deserve something and I just pray Lord Jesus for me for everyone for us today that we would receive even more of your Holy Spirit. We put our hands out, first of all, to surrender. We surrender from our ways, our lives, our plans, our agendas, our efforts, trying to help you, God. We surrender, we put our hands out and surrender, but we put our hands out to receive. And I just pray, God, for every single person here, they receive of the Holy Spirit today of God. That's it, just by faith, receive more of the Spirit of God. Every day I need more grace. I need to receive more grace from God. I need to receive more of the Spirit. Be being filled with the Spirit of God in our lives. Receive it. Just receive more of the Spirit. And Jesus, I pray, disrupt our plans. God, take us off road. Lord, nudge us. Lead us, guide, prompt us. Come on, everyone with me. Just make that little prayer to the Lord today. I'm going to listen when you speak. I'm going to obey when you prompt. God, I'm going to go from surviving to thriving every single day. Your will be done in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.